Hi everyone, I'm Aaron Williams, again, reporter, Washington Post, and I'm here to talk to you all about visual lighting, visualizing data and race. Uh, this title's kind of obtuse, but the idea I kind of want to walk you through today is how um, in the United States we've looked at race data um, over the last you know, 100 or so years, how it's been visualized, and, or how some people have visualized it, and kind of the implications of that. So again, Aaron Williams, you already got my bio. But I'm actually going to talk about this guy. Uh, so I don't know if you know who this is. This is uh, W.E.B. Du Bois. The W.E.B. stands for William Edward Burgart. And I know we're in France, so you might say, hey, Aaron, that should be Du Bois, right? No, it's pronounced Du Bois. That's how he pronounced it. That's how I'm pronouncing it. Uh, so that's what we're doing, right? So Du Bois was a... Uh, really a Renaissance man. He was um, a philosopher, a sociologist, writer. He was the first African American to receive a doctorate from Harvard. Um, and on top of that, he did data visualization, which is kind of wild. So about 118 years ago, I think I got my math right, so 1900, uh, there was the World's Fair here in Paris. And uh, he, along with some other enterprising African Americans like Booker T. Washington and William Calloway, came here to kind of show the progress African Americans had made roughly 35 years after the Civil War. Uh, the South was in disarray. Uh, that's where the majority of the black population was at. And so he wanted to show how, to you know, the rest of the world kind of what had changed in the, in, in the last 30 or 40 years. And he chose, in, in, in the means he in which he chose to do that was data visualization. So for example, here's one that's looking at the black and white population. You kind of can't tell because the white population is like part of the paper. But uh, you can see from 1800 to uh, 1890, you know, the increase of the black population. This is really a, just a visualization of the slave trade. And, kind of, and it kind of ends, and you, you kind of see after 1860, that's the end of the, like, or 65 is the end of the Civil War. And then you kind of see the increases there. And these are really striking visualizations. Uh, this one's kind of confusing. Um, but, and I, and it, like, so what this is trying to show you here is like uh, the distribution of, uh, of uh, African Americans by square mile in the US. And so up top, that green bar, that cities, I think, uh, well, it's by square mile. So the top one is uh, 10,000 inhabitants per square mile, yada, yada, yada. But down here, we're seeing that the majority of the black population lives in the country and villages, so like rural parts of the country. Uh, this is another really striking chart uh, that looks at the proportion of freed uh, slave or freed African Americans versus those in slavery. Obviously, starting with 1790, the majority of the black population is enslaved. Again, 65 is the end of the Civil War, and so you can kind of see there uh, that we've uh, you know been free for a hot minute. Uh, and then you can also see here uh, that you know kind of the same distribution here: uh, free laborers, mostly slaves. So it's kind of the same chart, just kind of a different idea. And so what, what I love about all these charts is that these are all things that like. I've designed like in other ways. I'm sure you all have too. Uh, but you know, he's doing them by hand. He was a teacher at Atlanta University, uh, where and so he and his students. He had roughly, I think it was like 25 or 30 students went and did this. Uh, so this is another striking chart. This is the uh, distribution of the black population uh, in the United States uh, as of 1900, roughly. And so, and again, like, you know, I know as I'm going through all these charts, you guys are like finding problems with like how he's visualizing the data because I am too. But you know, I'm going to give the man some credit because it was like 1900 and he did it by hand. Uh, so uh, again, you see the, uh, you know, basically the southern half of the United States is predominantly where uh, black people live. And, and you know, really like Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, that's where the concentration's at. So again, this was 1900, right? Um, and so one thing that I'm always fascinated by is like how these things that happen, you know, what feels like, you know, literally centuries ago, how they compare now. So what if we were to look at the concentration of the black population in the US today, or at least an estimate according to the latest data? Well, it looks like this. And so for me, that is incredibly striking, right? Like you're looking at 118 years ago and then today, right? And the, the, the concentration is still there. And there's a story behind that, right? We're talking like right after the end of the Civil War, there was immense, immense uh, laws that tried to prevent African Americans from doing just the most basic things, including moving around. Um, and so it, which it would mean that over time, you, it would make sense that the, the, uh, the concentration of African Americans still exists in the South, and that's true today. That's where most black people in America live. 
Um, and so the, I wanted to kind of dig into this um, idea a bit. Um, and I, so what I started doing was I pulled census data for the last 30 years or so, including these estimates. So every, every 10 years, we have a census in the US. And then every year, they do what's called the American Community Survey. That's what ACS stands for. And they, and they kind of do, they do some surveys, and they do estimates. So they're not hard counts like the normal census, but they give us some idea. And, and for the most part, they're pretty good. The five years about the best data. Um, and so I started looking at different cities. And so the first city I started with was the city I live in, which is Washington, DC. And so I did a distribution by race. Sorry, it's a little blurry. But it's really interesting, right? So what you can see, so this is, these are all 2016 estimates that I'm about to show you. And so here in Washington, DC, we have, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's actually a fairly diverse city. But you can kind of see just in the southeastern section of the city, there's this large concentration of African Americans. Um, and so that was really interesting to me. Uh, again, I looked at Atlanta. You kind of see the stark divide, right? Well, this is actually the counties that surround Atlanta, but you can see here there's this stark divide between white and black. And then uh, what's really interesting, though, is these pockets of the Asian American population that are beginning to bubble up in the South and the stories behind that. Here's New York City. Um, Again, you know, you can see, you know, all the boroughs, and you know, you can obviously point out Brooklyn and uh, Queens, kind of here in the bottom half, and then up top the Bronx. And again, those are large African American populations. And the reason why I started digging into this is because, you know, I've lived uh, in all kinds of places. I'm from the Bay Area originally, hence the Okanda. Uh, Sweatshirt. I grew up in the Bay Area, and every time I go back home, people tell me, "Oh man, the Bay's changing. You know, these people are moving in, these people are moving out, people are getting pushed out." And you know, usually the word that's thrown around with this is gentrification. And I and I and it's a topic that's talked about a lot, but I wanted to find a way to actually measure. It. Like, how do you actually try to figure out what is segregated, what is not, and can we look at like how things have changed over time, right? So anyway, as I started digging into this, I ended up creating this map. Right, so this is that, all that data just now for the entire US. Um, and we've seen dot density maps like this before. But what's really striking to me about this map is that immediately you can see what's often referred to as the black belt, right? the southern, southeastern part of the United States that comprises most of the black population. You also see just the rise of the Hispanic population. You know, like This is Albers, USA, so we got you know, uh, Hawaii and Alaska superimposed here. But you know, that's supposed to be Mexico. Well, that's supposed to be. That is Mexico. Uh, and so you can obviously influx there. What's also really striking is right here, kind of around Arizona, is this large Native American population, which is really fascinating to me. It was just really interesting to see, based on these estimates, kind of where the population lies. Uh, Hawaii has a, quite a large Asian population. And then you can immediately see the cities, kind of these sunburst spots throughout, which I think is really fascinating. So um, I got here, but I didn't get here by myself. Uh, I actually was inspired by this project, right? which I think we've, a lot of people have seen. This is by Dustin Cable at the University of Virginia. He did this about, it was 2003, so what's that? Or, uh, 2013, sorry. So like, you know, roughly five years ago, uh, he did this really, really fantastic uh, dot density map of the US using 2010, uh, 2010, the 2010 census. And you can kind of zoom in, explore it, and all that. Uh, also, another shout out to Amanda Cox, who's like, the, she's killing it. Uh, she did this uh, back in 2015 along with Tom G and uh, Matt Block. So again, mapping segregation. But again, this is the thing I was concerned about. Like, it says mapping segregation. This is not a shot at Amanda or anyone. But what we're actually seeing is a map of race. I wanted to actually be like, can you measure segregation? Like, can we get like a number or some kind of way to get into that? Um, some of my colleagues have tried this. So this is a map that Dan Keating and uh, Laris Karklis uh, have done at the Washington Post. And this was measuring diversity. And the measure they use here is something called the, oh, it's called the diversity index. Uh, it's a measure that was pioneered by, I believe, uh, Philip Meyer, uh, who's kind of, kind of considered the, one of the founding fathers of data journalism, if you will, while he was at uh, USA Today, I believe. Um, and what this is showing is just like what parts of the country are getting more diverse, less diverse, where is it really increasing, decreasing, things like that. And so they created this map. Um, and so I started digging into these metrics of segregation, because there's a lot of different ways people measure it. And what I found out was that there's about, there's roughly, there's a lot of different ways to do it, but people tend to stick to five categories, so to speak. So you have evenness, you have exposure, concentration, centralization, and or centralization, yes, and uh, clustering. And these all mean different things to different people, to different researchers. Um, most segregation, most of these measures came out of the 70s, out of the kind of social science boom that happened in the United States and uh, across the globe. And so, you know, there's a lot of different ways to do it, but I focused on evenness for this project. And the, the measure I used was something called the multi-group 
entropy index. Uh, it was made by this guy named, uh, I forgot his, actually, I forgot his first name, Thiel. It's called, it's something called Thiel's index. Uh, and actually, when it first was created, it was, I think, an, actually an economic measure. It wasn't meant for segregation. And in fact, a lot of the measures for segregation don't really look, actually are about race. What, they, what they're actually looking at is like, where are things distributed within a geography? Where are certain variables clustered? So th th these measures are used for a lot of things. Like this measure was used to look at like algae distribution in like one part of the world. Um, I've seen it used for all kinds of different things. So it's not, a uniquely, it's not uniquely for segregation, but it's what most social sciences have used, right? And so I talk, uh, so the US, like the census, so the, um, for all of these, uh, all the data comes from shapefiles from the United States Census Bureau, and they're broken up, and they kind of break up uh, the whole country into tracks, and within those tracks you have what's called uh, blocks, and then within that, or Right, actually, there's one before that, then block groups, then blocks. Like, it's just like various delineations. So I kind of looked at the smallest measure and worked my way up. All right, so you have Chicago, right? Chicago is a really great city. Um, and so what I did was, well, this is actually um, a product of me and a, a colleague, Larius Karklis, who did the diversity map to begin with. I sent him those kind of data splotches that you guys saw earlier, and then he brought in um, data from OpenStreetMap and here and some other sources, and we did this overlay in order to kind of give people some context with the data they're looking at. And so this is Chicago. If you know about anything about Chicago, the South Side is known as you know a heavily black area, and it's also known as you know a, it, it's actually a pretty nice area, but it, you know it does have violence for sure. Um, and you can see the West Side here, Garfield Pi Park. That's another well-known black area. So again, most maps of segregation look like this. So then I created this map. And so this is using that multi-group entropy index to actually try to measure this. And so sure enough, you can see the areas that are predominantly black um, are purple here. So this is scale, less diverse, purple, green, more diverse. And you can kind of, now we're actually starting to measure it in a way that makes sense, right? Like at least, or at least now we have a statistic or some kind of value to work with. Um, I did this initially for just DC, Houston, Los Angeles, Chicago, and New York, right? Big cities, and then DC because I, I live in DC, and like you gotta do it. Uh, but then, you know, my bosses were like, you know what, just do it for the, the nation. I was like, all right, fine. So um, I published the story, this came out a couple of weeks ago, uh, where I just basically, we, I talked to a lot of researchers, uh, Maria Kreisen at the University of Chicago, or University of Illinois at Chicago, where we basically, like and uh, Michael Bader at American University and Kyle Crowder, we, we talked and they were like, yeah, America's actually way more, di more, way more diverse than it's been in years, but it's still segregated. And this is so fascinating because there's been since the 60s um, regulations by the United States government and by other people to desegregate society. And what we're seeing is that, well, I mean, we're more diverse, there's more kinds of people, people live in cities and obviously cities tend to be diverse, but we still have these issues of segregation. And what I wanted to be, to be able to do with this was not just tell that story, but then give the reader something to do as well, right, to explore that data. Because, uh, you know, I think one big part of being a data journalist is allowing people to not just look at data uh, and tell them a story about it, but then let them find the narratives that they are interested in. And so what I ended up doing next was uh, creating a map. So we're starting in DC. And this was made on the hotel Wi Fi. It was like a last minute edition, so sorry for the, the rendering slowness. But you can kind of see I was able to kind of allow people to really just like walk around the data. And it's really fast to look at it at this scale where you're getting just kind of how the country is made up. Um, you know, so now we're zooming into New York. And what's really interesting, uh, and then what I did on top of that was then add a toggle so that people could then switch into the diversity view and then walk around the data. And, I, and it goes back to 1990. And so basically in almost every major city, you'll, you'll see that, uh, that kind of pivot from uh, diversity or for like, it's getting more diverse, but there's still pockets of the city, like here, we're here in Brooklyn, that have been a little, that are becoming a little less uh, diverse over time. Um, and this is really interesting to me because um, America uh, has been fascinated with race from the jump since its beginnings. And I often hear things from my friends in Paris and other countries or in other places about like, Americans are obsessed with race. And I was like, well, yes we are, but like everybody's obsessed with race, we just measure it all the time. Um, uh, you know, but like race isn't uniquely American in any way, but it's, what is kind of unique is that we measure it. And I first actually ran into this when I joined the post. So, um, I had just joined, I was brand new, um, and the, the, the t attacks happened in Brussels, and I kept seeing these news reports of like, 
Dino. The admission of these two neighborhoods, Molin Beak and Shore Beak, sorry if I'm pronouncing these incorrectly, um, they were like, these are terrorist breeding grounds. And I was like, okay, well, I, I, this sounds familiar to me because as an American citizen, right, like going back to Chicago, you hear things about how, you know, Chicago is a war zone. The, you know, the black population is getting decimated and they're killing each other. And these are narratives that don't reflect my reality because, again, I'm black. Like, I, 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 I've walked in this skin my entire life and I've been in, I've explored parts of Chicago and obviously I'm not like, you know, I didn't grow up in any kind of like absolute poverty or um, violence, but certainly I know what it's, I I know I, I, I got what it was like to hear something and then not actually experience it. And so I wanted to see, can we dig into the demographics of, say, a place like Brussels, right? And I did. Um, I didn't, I'm not going to put any of the charts I did, but I went and pulled up the data. Um, I, I, I actually asked the census people, and they got back to me, which is very nice. Uh, very different from a lot of times when you email people in the US for, for data. Um, and I, and yeah, and, he got me back, and I got back all this data. And, but one thing that was missing was uh, the race component, right? You had you know, Belgian, non-Belgian, Belgian with my, migrant background, and that was about all you got. Yeah, I mean, and you got education, you got income, you got all these other things, but the race component was missing. And that's pretty much how a lot of Western Europe operates. Um, and I get why, there's, there's a lot of history as to why that exists here in Europe. And I, and I like, and, you know, I'm not here to like litigate whether or not, or like to say like, you guys need to start doing this. But one thing that, that again, that fascinates me, and I'm gonna go back a couple of slides, if I can. Uh, but yeah, it going, so too many. Yeah, there you go. All right, so like again, one thing I find fascinating about doing this kind of data and this kind of research and this kind of journalism is that in the US, like, we can start like, digging into assumptions a lot of people have. Um, so for example, again, you know, a lot of people in Chicago say, it's such a diverse city. I'm like, no, it's not. Like, it's diverse in that you have a lot of different people there, but they live in these concentrations. And there's, there's even more assumptions we can kind of tackle. I'm a go sorry, I'm jumping around a bit. I apologize. But, um, like going back to DC, what's really fascinating is if you look in the southeast city, I don't have the borders, so I apologize, but it's kind of where the city's at right here, like this really dark uh, blue splotch right up there. Um, so that's southeast DC. It's sometimes called Anacostia, or it, it is called Anacostia, but it's the river, and there's also a neighborhood. Um, and that area is, is predominantly black and has, is very low income. And so oftentimes when people talk about racism, gentrification, segregation, the, the, one of the arguments that comes up is, well, you know, it's not really about race, it's about preference. Like that area is obviously poor. Up there, up top, you know, where there's a larger white population, that's like the Bethesda area of uh, Maryland. That area obviously has more money. White people historically have had more money in the US, so that's where the white people at, that's where the black people are. It's that simple. But here, PG County has some of the wealthiest zip codes in the United States, but it's still all black. So the question is, why? Well, the, why is racism? But, uh, like, <laughs> but yeah, but like, you know, like th 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 these patterns exist for a reason. They did not, they did not just like appear out of nowhere, right? So again, going all the way back, I guess I gotta find a more elegant way to do this, I apologize. So going back, back to uh, my, my, my Brussels, uh, you know, story, I, you know, that was just something I was really struck by, right? Um, and other people have tried to, do, to like kind of tackle this issue. So this is really great. Uh, project done. I think it was with Spiegel Online and BR Data. They're out in um, Germany. And so they, they took two people, uh, Hannah and Ishmael, both Germans, um, but you know, had them basically go try to find uh, places to live. And what they found was they had radically different experiences, right? These are called audit surveys in the US. It's just like one way of measuring segregation. But the hard part of, of doing this kind, or the, one of the things that this misses is that segregation doesn't just happen like when you go to rent an apartment, right? Like these things are embedded deep, deep into society. Things that, you know, predate everyone in this room, right? And so like, the thing is, is that when we're trying to measure it, I think we really have to be careful with just like doing these kind of like, you know, drop in real quick and be like, obviously racism. I think this is a great project and I think it illustrates a problem that exists in other parts of Europe. But I think, again, one of the reasons why I really liked the project I worked on was that we weren't just doing random audit surveys. We got like actual data, we measured it, and then we, we did a story on it, right? And so, um, I actually, I talk really fast, so this kind of makes sense while I'm getting toward the end of my project, but uh, we talk. But um, I really like this quote by W.E.B. Du Bois. So this was years later. Um, he, I think he had moved to Africa by this point. 
um, or maybe it was like close to moving to Africa. And uh, he was talking to someone over, um, someone in Texas was like really interested in how, how he like over time has like been able to do the things he does and like liberate people. And, he's, and he wrote back a letter saying, the modern way of showing progress of groups of people is by a series of very carefully thought out charts, diagrams, models, etc. This takes the place of exhibits for Negroes. I think it was most, effective used in the, most effectively used in Paris a Paris exhibition in 1900, we won a gold medal for a series of 25 charts. So again, that's cool that I'm sure some of y'all in here have won like Molofi Edge and other awards. He won a gold medal at the World Fair. So like, you know, step your game up. But uh, I think this is really, <laughs> I think this is really great quote because often when we think of data visualization, we, we, like, we work with data, like we work with like business data, we work with other kinds of things. I'm a journalist, um, and so like I often work with gun data, race, things like that, and like I visualize all kinds of things. But this is the first time I like read a quote where someone was like, "No, literally, in order to show the progress of a people, we use charts," um, which is like really fascinating. I mean, people have like I mean, people have used charts and, and things about race and whatnot, but his were really gorgeous and and they had depth to them. And so, if I had to sum up more or less what I well, I'm not going to say what I think he was saying, but this is how I've interpreted it. I've interpreted it as visualization can facilitate liberation. And I think that that is incredible. I think that when we, the work we do, that a lot of people here do in this room, has the potential to move people in ways that, you know, purely as a text, purely a photograph, purely a video can't do. Um, or, um, as was mentioned before, in some kind of concert of all those things together, we can present really powerful ideas in ways that you alone wouldn't, would, each one of these tools. And um, again, my role is a journalist, um, but my, I'm also a liberator, you know, by trade, you know, that's what I try to do. So I think that if you want to, if you are in the uh, business of trying to liberate people, um, data visualization is a great way to do it. And so with that, thank you. <laughs>